Gospel of John tonight, John chapter number 8, verse number 24. John 8, 24. I said therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Verse 28. Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And then verse 58. John 8, verse 58. Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Yeah, Father, I pray your blessing, your holy word, to the hearts of the people. Lord, give me that gift of teaching that I need tonight, unction and wisdom in the scripture. In thy name I pray, amen. You can be seated. Now, what I read to you from the eighth chapter of the Gospel of John is three of the most powerful statements, some of the most powerful statements in the New Testament as it relates to the deity of Christ. In these texts here in John 8 verse 24, if you believe not that I am, if you'll notice the he is in italics, I'm glad the King James translators are honest, aren't you? There is no corresponding word in the Greek text for he, personal pronoun. It's simply in there for clarity or continuity. If you go to the Greek text, it says, ego I me, ego I me. That is an emphatic, I am, that I am, that I am. The correspondence to that is found in the book of Exodus, chapter number 3, and verse number 14. When Moses said, who am I going to tell them sent me? You tell them, I am, hath sent you. I am, that I am, the self-existing one. As I've said to you before, the gospel of John is the gospel that is altogether separate from Matthew, Mark, and Luke in the sense that the direction of the message is not about an earthly kingdom. It's about the kingdom of God and the new birth into it. The new birth is not mentioned in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but it is mentioned in the gospel of John. You must be born again. The chronology of the New Testament does not have Matthew, Mark, and Luke or John as the first books written. I know they show up in your Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you just assume because they're the first books in order that you have in the New Testament that they were the first ones written. Far from it. The Gospel of John was written, as I say, somewhere about 90, 95 A.D., somewhere about the time of the book of Revelation. The reason I say that, that's the conclusion I've come to, is because of the message of John. Long after the kingdom of heaven has been placed in abeyance, but the first book of the New Testament is more than likely the book of 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians, the burden of it is the second coming of Christ. The book of 1 Thessalonians was written sometime between 30, 35, and 40 A.D., not long after the ascension of Christ. Now I want you to think about the chronology of the New Testament. If they had rejected the Messiah, they rejected the kingdom, the Lord had ascended back to heaven, Acts chapter number 1, then it's no longer about a Jewish kingdom. It's about a Gentile bride, right? It's about a Gentile bride and not a Jewish kingdom. And that is if you believe in dispensations, which I do firmly believe. The last, book of the, of the last chapter of the book of Acts, Paul said, I go to the Gentiles and they'll hear it. And he quotes Isaiah chapter number 6 where God says, I'm going to, I'm going to close their eyes. I'm going to blind them. And he did. So the book of 1 Thessalonians Probably the first book of the New Testament written, written folks, written about 35, 40 A.D., somewhere between 30 and 40 A.D., somewhere. It's hard to nail these dates down exact, but it's early, very early, because the, uh, the usual date given for the crucifixion and the ascension of Christ is about 30 A.D., because he was born about 3, 4, or 5 B.C., and we can't nail that date down exactly either. But uh, about 30 A.D. would be, the, would be the, uh, the, the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ. And so you know that when he had died, was buried, and rose again, you know, therefore, that the Jewish kingdom is no longer being offered to the Jewish people. That was only during his lifetime. 
and during his personal ministry to Israel. And they rejected that. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the burden of those three gospels is the kingdom of heaven here on this earth. If you ever one time get a hold of that, the fact that the vast difference between Matthew, Mark, and Luke and the gospel of John is that Matthew, Mark, and Luke is offering the kingdom of heaven on this earth. John is talking about the kingdom of God and the new birth. Then it helps you to lay it out in the right order. Now what you find in the gospel of John are words that show up sometimes uh, far more than they do in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And it's a good study to find out how these words, certain words that are that are uh, showcased, as you say, as you'd say in the Gospel of John. They're, they're far more prevalent than they are in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Let me give you some of them tonight. The word, uh, uh, the word abide, for example, and is found 41 times in the Gospel of John, and it's only found 12 times in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The word believe, pistuo, is found 99 times in the Gospel of John, and it's only 26, uh, 9, 30 is, is 34. It's found, 35 rather. It's found 35 times in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but it's found 99 times in John. Far more in that one Gospel, the word believe. And we started this about the Father. Remember, I talked to you about the Father. The Father is found 121 times in the Gospel of John, over twice as many times as it is in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. After a while, you begin to have to ask yourself this question. There must be some reason then that these words are saturated in the Gospel of John and they don't show up that much in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And there is a reason. Because the Holy Spirit is calling your attention to some, to some, to some salient facts, some doctrines. The word Jews, for example. J-E-W-S, Jews shows up 71 times in the Gospel of John, and it only shows up, let's see, five, 10, 17 times. It shows up 17 times in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but it shows up 71 times in the Gospel of John. Stop for a moment. There's got to be something going on. And the first point is this. There's a confrontation taking place between Christ and the Jews and the Holy Spirit wants you to know what is the message that's involved in this confrontation. And the eighth chapter of the Gospel of John that we just read from is the classic chapter of the confrontation between Christ and the Jews. And when you get home, look at John chapter number 8 and verse number 44. You might want to look at it right now. John 8, 44. You don't get any stronger than what he said to them in John 8, 44. And this is the confrontation between Christ and and the Jews. What does he say in John 8, 44? You are of your what? The devil. The devil. That's strong talk. So what we have here now is a confrontation between Christ and the Jews. Now, the Holy Spirit wants you to know what was their argument? What did they accuse him of? And where did Christ stand in all of this? And just a few minutes ago when I started this lesson tonight, which chapter did I read from where he said, I am that I am? John 8. All right, I want you to compare the Lord Jesus saying, I am that I am, with saying to them, you are of your father the devil. See the contrast? Couldn't be greater. And a lot, of, a lot of things, the best way to learn them is by contrast. Contrast. You are of the devil, I am of the father, and I am eternal. He said to them, you are from beneath, I am from above. So the word, uh, the, uh, the word Jews is prevalent. The word know, to know, to know, is found 117 times in the Gospel of John. These things are written that you might know, know that you have eternal life. In John chapter, uh, in, in the Gospel of John, 36 times the word life shows up. Uh, we've got 11, 6, 17. 17 times in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, 17 times the word life shows up. But here in the Gospel of John, it shows up 36 times. You know why? Because he's offering them eternal life. Exactly. And then a couple of more, and we'll, uh, we'll uh, the word witness, martureo, where we get our word martyr. Uh, these, uh, these murderers that killed all those people over there in, uh, in uh, Belgium, 
uh, they think they're martyrs. They found out real fast that they're not martyrs. They're not martyrs. When you leave this world a mass murderer, that's not a martyr. But anyway, the word martyr shows up 40, 33 times, rather 33 times in the Gospel of John. The word uh, uh, witness that's translated, martyr that's translated witness shows up 33 times. And it only shows up three times, three times in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Isn't that remarkable? The witness is important. The Holy Spirit says, watch this witness. The word world, cosmos, and there's two different types of, two different words translated world, but cosmos, what does that refer to? That refers to the physical creation, all right? The physical creation shows up 79 times in the Gospel of John, and uh, 6 and 9 is 15 times in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Isn't that amazing? But here's the one I want to I show you some things from tonight. It only shows up in the Gospel of John. What's that? Verily, verily. Only John. And the word verily means amen. So in the Gospel of John, it is amen, amen. That's a Hebrew word. The Hebrew word amen means stop a moment. True and faithful is the witness of what you just heard. If you're in a Jewish synagogue today, and you listen carefully, you'll hear Hebrew, and you'll hear the Jews say, Amen. Because that's a Hebrew word. True and faithful. The Lord Jesus is saying, Verily, verily, truly, truly it is so. Listen carefully to what I am saying to you, because this is very, very important. And I'm going to give you just a few illustrations of it tonight to show you what we're talking about. For example, John chapter number 3, verse 3, he said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, rather. Now, this is important, this is important, Nicodemus. See, get this, Nicodemus. This is important. This is very important. Except a man be born again, he cannot even see the kingdom of God. There's a huge controversy in the New Testament about what the new birth consists of and when it takes place. Herbert W. Armstrong, the one who started the Worldwide Church of God, taught, and I suppose he taught it until the day he died, that the Lord Jesus Christ was born again. And he taught that he was born again at his resurrection. All right. The Bible says that the Lord Jesus Christ was declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead. He perverts that scripture and distorts it and makes it, and makes it say that at the resurrection of Christ, he was born again. Now, of course, that begs the question, what do you mean, Mr. Armstrong, by born again? I understand born again in the Bible to mean that I am literally born of the spirit of the living God because my spirit is dead in sins and trespasses. So I need to be born of God. And so, therefore, if that's what he believes, he believes the Lord Jesus at his resurrection was born of God. How could that be so since he is God? So you got a problem here. And you always get yourself in a mess when you get off in some messed up theology and try to prove something like that. But the Lord said, Nicodemus, truly, truly, verily, verily, amen, amen, you must be born again. And that's a broad subject. That's a subject that, cover, that covers people, time, and space. And it's not something that I could handle in just one lesson in here tonight to talk to you. But I'll tell you this. Being born again is a big deal. And it's a subject that is broad in its spectrum. Notice John chapter number 3 and verse 11. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen. And you receive not our witness. Now what's he saying? He's saying that I, the Lord Jesus Christ, 
am witnessing to you the truth that I have received from my Father which is in heaven, and you refuse to believe the truth that I'm giving you, and so therefore what's left for you? I am the way, the, and the life. He is truth personified. Any truth that professes to be truth, this is what this means. Any truth that professes to be truth will find its fulfillment in the Lord Jesus Christ because he is truth personified. Not relevant truth, but absolute truth because he's a person. Being a person, he's not relevant truth. He's absolute truth. I am the way, the truth. You don't have your truth and I've got my truth. The Lord Jesus Christ is the truth. If you don't accept the Lord Jesus Christ, you've rejected the truth. Amen. See what I mean? All right. John 5, verse 19. Then answered Jesus, said to them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, now watch this carefully, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. All right. In verse, chapter 3, verse 11, he can only speak what the Father gives him to speak. John 5, verse 19, I can only do what the Father gives me to do. He said, listen, listen, this is important. I am in obedience to the Father. John 5, 24, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me, will one day, after a life of good works, have everlasting life. That's religion, folks, by the way. That's the junk you get. What does it say in the Bible? And believeth on him that sent me, hath, present tense, everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death into life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. Why? I am the resurrection and the life. There again, he is the resurrection personified. What's that mean? It means this. If you do not come up in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will literally be cast out from the earth. For the Bible says the earth shall cast out the dead. Resurrection is to be brought back to life, right? The hour is coming when the dead, unsaved, will come up from the graves. But folks, they're not coming up with life. They're not being raised to life. They're simply being brought up out of the place of condemnation to stand being judged as a sinner and cast into the second death. Nothing but death for them. So anything that professes to give life and resurrection apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, is a lie. He is the resurrection and the life. This is true, uh, verily, verily. John 6, 30, 6 20, 26, John 6, 26. Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say to you, you seek me. Now, this is strong stuff right here because this applies as clear to today as it ever did. You seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. And they fill their churches today with people who are seeking the same thing. You agree? Well, certainly they do. That's not what they appeal to. They appeal to the flesh. Satisfy the flesh. He said, here, you don't even seek me because of what I do, the miracles. You seek me because you get your belly fed. You don't even seek me because of who I am. That's higher than the miracles. Because when Satan shows up in Revelation 13, he'll be working miracles, right? That's higher. His person, who he is, is the greatest point in seeking Almighty God because you want to know the Son. Not about him, you want to know him. Amen. Somebody comes up to me and says, you know, I bet so-and-so, and let me tell you about him. Oh, that's great. I want to meet him. You can tell me about them till I'm blue in the face. Let me go meet them. And then I'll form my own opinion. 
That's what we're talking about tonight. So in John chapter number 6, verse 53, Jesus said to them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Now here we stumble. <laughs> Don't we stumble? <laughs> so what do you mean stumble? Because we have a priest who offers the sacrifice of the mass and he calls it the Eucharist. And each time that the Catholic goes to an assembly, and not only Catholics, but there's a lot of others too, comes to the assembly, he partakes of the literal body and symbolically of the blood because the priest uh, usually drinks the, the wine and gives the wafer to the people. And by doing this, they have partaken of Christ. How do they do this? They do this by changing a piece of bread and a little wine into the body and blood of Christ. Why do they do this? They do this because they take literally John chapter number 6. Except you eat my flesh and drink my blood. Now I want to ask you a question. Do you know of anyone who ever ate his flesh or drank his blood when he was here? No, sir. Well, then if they didn't do it then, why should we do it now? That's not going to save you. He said, the words that I say unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Knowing full well that 2,000 years later, people would be so far removed from his physical flesh, which was not only here 40 days anyway. So far removed from that, that there's no way that they could ever partake of it. And of course, the Catholic Church has an answer. It's called transubstantiation. In other words, it becomes substantial because they've transferred this power onto it and by a, some kind of a formula, however they do it, the people receive the body and the blood of Christ. If you had eaten his flesh, God forbid the blasphemy of it, or drunk his blood, do you think that would have saved you 2,000 years ago? No. That's not faith. Your faith is in Christ and the truth of the matter is, I want you to think long and hard on what I'm about to say to you. Your faith is not in a dead Christ. Your faith is in a living Christ. Yes, sir. Because had he stayed dead, folks, then your faith would be, it'd be finished. Be dead. It's because he lives. He said, I sh he said because I live, you shall live also. And John, in Revelation, he said, I am he that liveth, the living one. That meant he had power over death. And death is the curse. And this is the last one, John 8, 58. I love this passage. I quoted it to you a little earlier. Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. <laughs> and see, in John 8, they've been making a big deal about being Abraham's seed. Well, they were Abraham's seed in the flesh. Now, why is this important? What is it about, what's the big difference between Abraham and Moses? It's important. This is a big deal. You say, well, no, wait a minute, preacher. I thought, I thought, uh, I thought uh, that the faith is the same. Well, the faith in the same God, yes. But there's a difference between Moses and Abraham. Big difference. Big difference. That's it. That's it. Abraham was justified how? By faith. By faith. Go back and read Genesis 15 when you get home. Read Genesis 15. And in Genesis 15, you'll see where God said, Abraham, look into the heavens. Count the stars. Tell them. In other words, that that's, means to count them. When you go to the bank, you go to the window of a what? Teller. And the tell means to count. And so count the stars, Abraham. Tell them, tell me how, many, tell me how many are there. Of course he couldn't do that. But Abraham said, I believe you. If you, you tell me how many is up there, I'm going to buy it. I'll believe it. <laughs> 2,000 trillion, that's fine with me, whatever. It's not important. You see, the Bible said he made the stars also. I wish somebody would get a hold of NASA over here and say, now look, 
We know it's up there. He made all that too, but that's no big deal. No, no. One human soul on this earth in the sight of God is far more important than every piece of dead rock floating around up there in the sky. Amen. He made the stars also. But he said, just believe me. You see them? Yes. Well, your seed will be like that. And it'll also be like the, sea, the, sand, the sand on the seashore. In other words, a heavenly seed and an earthly seed. You'll have both. I believe you, Lord. And the Bible said he counted it to him for righteousness. The Old Testament saint became righteous by believing God. That was Abraham 500 years before the law was given. The covenant was based on a blood covenant and it was freely given and he accepted it by faith. And because he accepted it by faith, he was received as a, as a child of God, as a saint of God, as a believer in the Lord. And, that's, and, that, and that did it. That was it. But when it came to Moses, he gave them the law not to save them. He gave them the law to condemn them. That was the purpose of the law, to condemn them and bring them guilty before God so that they would cry out to God, Lord, give me a Savior. And then he gave them the blood sacrifice that they offered continually to the Lord that could not put away sins, but he showed them in that that the day would come when the Lamb of God would come and he would die for the sins of mankind. So the Gospel of John is different. And that's the point I've been trying to make with you uh, over and over and over and over again, that the Gospel of John is written that you might believe. I want you to look at John 1, verse 1. John 1, 1. <clears throat> John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All right. Who's the Word? The Lord Jesus. Does John say he's God? Yes, he does. Now look at John chapter number 20 and verse number 28. John chapter number 20, verse 28. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God, the Gospel of John starts with the Lord Jesus being God and it winds up. Look at verse 31. But these are written that ye might believe. There's that word believe that shows up 99 times in the Gospel of John. These things are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. All right, now I want you to follow on with me here. And you've gotten, to, uh, you've gotten to, uh, to the point there where salvation in the Gospel of John is about believing, right? What's missing from the end of this book here? I'll tell you what, let's, I don't want to make it difficult. Let's go back to Mark chapter number 16. All right, verse 15. Now, folks, I'm not trying to pit one gospel against another to, to, to say one is to, inferior. You, you know good and well that's not what I'm saying. One fits in one period of time and the other fits in another period of time. That's important to understand. I love Mark. I love Matthew. I love Luke just like John. But I know where they belong. Now, here you have in Mark chapter number 16. This should be important to you living here in East Tennessee because right above you in Kentucky and in the mountains of North Carolina and Virginia and here in Tennessee, you have an issue. Look at Mark chapter number 16, verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. 
In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues. Watch this. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then after they had spoken, he was caught up in the presence of God. Now, have you, do you know of anyone who's died at the hands of a rattlesnake or a copperhead or a poisonous serpent? You know, I mean, I don't know anybody personally, but I've certainly read about them. I don't make fun of these people. Uh, it, to me, it takes a lot of courage to have your hands full of rattlesnakes. And either a lot of courage or a lot of something else. <laughs> you know, one or the other. <laughs> uh, no, I don't make fun of them. I've tried to study them and understand them. And most of them say, we're not trying to show God that we have faith. This is our faith. That's the way they put that. And I try to, I try to make sense of what they're saying by that. In plain words, when we come to church... And we sing the songs of Zion and we fellowship with each other. And then I get up here and preach. And you come in here and you, you pour your heart out and you worship God. You're worshiping God. That's, that's manifesting your faith, all right? That's, that's what you're about. To them, if they don't handle snakes, they're not worshiping. If I understand correctly what they're saying, that's what they're saying. Because that is their faith. And then, of course, all of that is built upon what scripture what did I just read to you? Okay, Mark, do you find that in Matthew? Do you find that in Luke? Do you find that in John? Is there anything in the Gospel of John about being baptized? But as far as the Gospel is concerned, no, no. There's no baptism connected with the Gospel, not in the Gospel. No. <laughs> You get off into that too. You got to, you got to, you got to, yeah. So what are you saying then? I'm saying, how do you reconcile the two? See, you remember the rich young ruler who came to him and said, master, what good thing can I do to inherit eternal life? What did he say to him? You know the what? Commandments. He brought in the 10 commandments, didn't he? Can you find them in John? See, I'm asking you questions tonight that other people could ask you. And you have to be able to, the Bible said to be given, given account for the faith that's within you, for your hope. How would you answer that? Well, I know how I'd answer it because that's what, what I've been teaching you. That's how I would answer it. I would answer it by simply saying, yes, Mark is right, Matthew's right, and Luke's right. But they're right for their time. They're right for their dispensation. But now, if you want to know what it takes to be born again, you better read the Gospel of John. And the Lord Jesus Christ is made clear and plain in the Gospel of John as to who he is. He's the Jewish Messiah, yes. But the Jewish, think about it this way. I'll ask you this question and you could go home and try to find the answer for it. Show me one scripture in the Old Testament, one scripture, just one that says clearly that the Jewish Messiah is the Son of God. You ever thought about that? Pardon? Yeah. Well, that's true. But the statement, the Son of God, remember? The Pharisees said, hold on a minute. You're making yourself equal to God. If you say you're the son of God, they were right. They were right by saying that. Of course, they rejected the notion. See, so you say, here, here's the issue. The Jewish Messiah in the Old Testament is a deliverer. And he could sit on a throne and he could rule and reign. What, was David the son of God? Of course not. But he was a king, right? A Messiah is the anointed one, Mashiach. That's what the word means, the anointed. But did not God anoint the priest? Did he not anoint the king? Did he not anoint the prophet? Were these not all anointed? Certainly they were. Did it make them the son of God? No. You see, the issue immediately comes up. 
between the Old Testament and the New Testament, and that's this. Where do you Christians get the idea that this man that lived 2,000 years ago is the Son of God? That's what the Jew will ask you. That he's God manifest in the flesh. The Muslim will say to you, God has no son. For God to have a son, the Muslim would say to you, that son would be equal with Allah. And Allah has no son. And that's as clear as it can be in the Quran. All right? He is arguing from the same premise that the Jew argues from. Now the term son of God, son of God, is a general term used in the Old Testament when it talks about the sons of God. You remember the Bible said that they were the sons of God, saw the daughters of men. They shouted at the creation, the book of Job, all right? But to take a man and call him the son of God. In the book of Ezekiel, the term son of man referring to Ezekiel shows up more than any book in the Bible. It's all over the book of Ezekiel. Son of man. When you get to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that term son of man, the Lord Jesus personally liked that term. You know why? That is the term of the God-man because he was son of man now. Mary was his mother, see, come to fulfill. He never became the son of God. Now let that settle in for a moment. He has always been the Son of God. He's the eternal one, right? But he was begotten of the Father 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem of Judea. And there was the Son of Man who came into this world and went to the cross and died for us. So the eternity of God in the Old Testament, when it comes to a son who is God incarnate in the flesh, it's not that clear. It's not that it's not in there. For unto us a child is born, a son is given, Isaiah chapter number 9. See? But the term is not that clear until the New Testament. When the Lord Jesus Christ walked on this earth, he said, if you've seen me, you've seen God. I and the Father are one. Thomas, my Lord and my God, he didn't rebuke him for it. The blind man, John 9, do you believe on the Son of God? Why do you want to do that? Remember I told you about that. You're out of the synagogue now. It's no longer the kingdom of heaven. Now it's a personal relationship between you and me. Do you believe on the Son of God? Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? I that speak to thee am he. I'm the Son of God. That's in John's gospel. So I, asked, I answer to the Jew. I answer the Jew like this. Christian, what makes you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? My Bible and the witness of the Holy Ghost. I can't prove to you that he's anybody or anything, but I can read the Bible and the Holy Spirit witnesses to the Bible because he changed my life from a child of hell to a child of God. And it came from the Bible. And I believe the Bible. And I believe the Bible witnesses to the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. And I believe that based on the book. By the way, Mr. Jew, you believe in Jehovah? You believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Where'd you get that? You got that in the Tanakh. You got that in the Old Testament. In the Bible. <laughs> so in other words, your authority for what you believe as a Jew is no greater than my authority for what I believe as a Christian. They know, they know that if they accept the deity of Christ, then that means that Jehovah who says, I am thy redeemer, I am the Savior, I created, I alone, I'm the one who did all these things. I have redeemed thee. Right. If you, can make, if you can make Jehovah of the Old Testament the Jesus of the New Testament, then what have you done? And there is a book in the Old Testament that does that. 
It makes Jehovah of the Old Testament the Jesus of the New Testament. Do you know which one it is? Zechariah. I hadn't planned on this, but let's just turn there and I'll be done. <laughs> Y'all are in a big hurry, are you? All right. Zechariah. Uh, last book. It's the last book in the Bible before the last book in the Bible. That's the easiest way to say it. Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah. I believe it's 1210. Yeah, here it is. All right. Now, I want you to start off, first of all, who we're talking about. Look at 12.8. In that day shall who? Jehovah. See the capital L-O-R-D? Shall Jehovah defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. He that is feeble among them that day shall be as David. House of David shall be as God the house and the angel of the Lord before them. Come to pass in that day that I, Jehovah, will seek to destroy all the nations come against Jerusalem. I, Jehovah, will pour upon the house of David, upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace supplications. They shall look upon me, Jehovah, whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one that mourneth for his only son. Jehovah said, you pierced me. When did that happen? Crucifixion. They'll have to answer for that. That's Jehovah and Jesus identified together in the Old Testament. Because they are one and the same. Father, I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come to your house, study your word tonight. And I pray you'd bless in the study of your word and bless those that have gathered out here tonight. We pray it in Jesus' name and amen.